Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is religious extremism. And we're fortunate to have with us to talk about religious extremism, Alana McLaughlin. And of course, Alana, let me uh, welcome you to the show this morning and to uh, have you to give our audience some information in reference to your background, education, and your experiences. And I think that uh, certainly you're no stranger to what we do here. And uh, uh, you've been with us uh, since you were, what, seven or eight years old? Mm -hmm. And so this might be your fifth, is it about your fifth year with us, fifth or sixth year with us? And seventh. Seventh year <laughs> with us. The time really flies. But what we want to do today is to talk about religious extremism. And you said that uh, it was a topic that you would like to uh, discuss this morning. And we want to give you an opportunity to do that. But before we do that, let's have you to give our audience, for those of, who might not know uh, some of the uh, things that you've been involved with, let's have you to give our audience uh, a sort of a, a review of your background, your ed education, and some of your experiences during this first segment. And then during the uh, second segment, we'll have an opportunity to get into the topic, religious extremism, to, uh, later on. Let's do it that way. Well, like you stated, my name is Alana McLaughlin. I am a sophomore at the Nashville School of Arts, where I specialize in the band conservatory, where I play trumpet. I march for Pearl Cones Marching Band, and I'm very big on academics and, and the instruments. I go to a school that's, you know, very big on music. Um, some of my background includes I've played for Lady Antebellum at Bridgestone Arena before with some of my fellow classmates at the Nashville School of Arts. Um, I'm just heavily involved in academics in my church, John Wesley United Methodist Church. And I've been on various leadership camps and groups, including the uh, summer camp for verbally and mathematically precocious youth at the Center for Gifted Studies at Western Kentucky University and the Junior National Young Leaders Conference in Washington, D.C. And so in real sense, you've been involved quite a bit, uh, dealing with a large number of things since we first started here. And I think you must have been, what, about six years old when we first started, five or six years old when we first started. Mm -hmm. And now we have an opportunity to meet you mm -hmm. as a sophomore mm -hmm. at uh, the Nashville School of Arts. And, and, and we're certainly delighted to have you here. Uh, now, the topic religious extremism, what do you, you mean when you talk about religious extremism, Lonnie? Religious extremism is a term that describes faith-based acts of terror, whether it be causing harm to someone like, you know, bombing their house or doing things like, you know, bullying someone, just acts of terror. And religious extremism is not to be confused with religious fundamentalism, which is where people interpret um, a, ho a holy word or take their faith so seriously that it becomes scary. For instance, a, an example of religious fundamentalism would be the snake handlers of Appalachia. These are people in the Appalachians who believe that the Bible says that we should take up serpents, so they literally take up serpents. They A part of their day-to-day -day worship is snake handling. And they call that snake worshiping. Is that what? Well, they call it snake handling. Handling. But mm -hmm. they do it because they say that the Bible says that we should, you know, take up serpents. That's an example of fundamentalism. That not all cases of religious fundamentalism hurt people, but the snake handlers have been bitten and have died from that. Religious extremism is almost always violent. And it is things like, for instance, 9-11, the terror attacks on the World Trade Center. That's an example of religious extremism. Someone doing something that was based upon their faith to cause terror and to hurt other people, which would be killing the people in New York City. These two things are commonly confused, but in the next segment, I'll be getting more into the differences and why both of these things are very scary. And so you think that this is something that our audience ought to uh, know this morning. Why should they know something about this? Because, like, how should I word this? Every day we see more examples of religious extremism, and we need to be aware of what this is and how to protect ourselves and how to know the signs of, of a religious extremist. Uh huh. Because that plays such a, a crucial part in terms of church terror. bombings, terror attacks. We need to be more aware of, of this because this is something that's becoming very prevalent in our society. And well, so what we'll do, we'll uh, take a, a 
our first commercial break. And then we'll come back and uh, we'll have about eight minutes and we'll give you an opportunity to talk about some aspects of religious extremism. And I think that you've got, got a plan to uh, cover many continents and whatnot and bring a number of things into view. And so we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Uh, Gregory Stewart. Okay. Gregory Stewart. Mm -hmm. Was he there when you were there? He was not. I had Bob Wilson. Wilson. Mm -hmm. What conservatory were you in? Media. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm not sure if they're still there. I don't think so. They might have turned like theater media or media uh, audio. Film, TV. Uh, yeah. they just called it MassCom, but also media. They combined it with theater so that okay. there's, te they call it tech, mm -hmm. okay. but it's a branch of theater, so yeah. Okay, great. Very good, okay, mm -hmm. so. And, and, and so you're practicing something that you learned at the National School of Arts, uh, an inspiration from there, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, I, I, ooh, <laughs> when I went, it was just starting, so uh -huh. um, if I can be truthful, uh, it's just, um, <laughs> It was all right, hard, but now it's, say, yeah. But, um, <laughs> Very good. I didn't really have structure. Mm. Yeah, NSA, NSA is really great, but it's, it's also very... Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Alana McLaughlin, and she's given us some information in reference to religious extremism. And of course, Alana, let's uh, see if we can pick up where we left off the uh, first segment and give you at least eight minutes to uh, be specific in reference to some of the uh, religious extremes that you, you would like our audience to uh, know about this morning and the impact that these extremes have on uh, the American population or the world population in a real sense. Well, for our viewers just tuning in, in the last segment I introduced myself, I talked a bit about my background in education, but I also got into what religious extremism is. And it is a term that describes faith-based acts of terrorism. And acts of terrorism span everything from murder, rape, kidnapping, acts of terror. And I also talked about the difference between religious extremism and religious fundamentalism. Now fundamentalism is where you're taking a religion's views or a, a holy word so literally that it could be dangerous, but most cases of religious fundamentalism aren't very dangerous. For instance, the snake handlers of Appalachia, which is here in Tennessee. In the Appalachian Mountains, there are a group of people who do their church services with serpents, with snakes, because they, because in the Bible it does say that we should take up serpents, but I don't think that they meant it literally. But a religious fundamentalist would take that literally, and that's what they do. They handle snakes, and that's a part of their culture, basically. Now, diving deeper into religious extremism, religious extremism comes in all, it's, it spans all continents and it comes in every shape or form and every skin color, every ethnicity, every culture. An example, now usually we see religious, uh, we see religious extremist groups in religions such as Islam, but we don't really talk about Christian or extremist groups in Judaism or in Buddhism because mainly Christian religious extremist groups and Jewish extremist groups are really, that took place more in the older days, more back in the day, you could say. And the more modern um, examples of religious extremism that we see do come from Islam, but there's no correlation between Islamic people and that it's just something that we just see more often. But not to say that there aren't, you know, still 
Christian extremist groups because there are. We just don't really hear about them as much as we do, say, Boko Haram or ISIS. An example of a Christian extremist group would definitely be the Army of God. Now, these people are comparable to the more popular Westboro Baptist Church, which is a church, it's like a family, and they go around, they pick it. Uh, army funerals and funerals of, say, Black Lives Matter protesters or gay people, or they go and they um, picket, you know, abortion clinics. That's an example of religious extremism because those people are saying hateful things like, oh, you should die or you should go this place and that place. But the Army of God is primarily very anti abortion. And they are known to do things like blow up abortion clinics, like Planned Parenthood, and things like that. But we don't really see this as much on, in the news, well, at least in the United States. And you have to really think, why is that? Because if you turn on CNN or Fox, you always see, oh, ISIS did this and Boko Haram did this, when they are both very bad groups and we need coverage on both because, you know, the army of God is happening right under our noses, you know? And so, uh, most people don't really know that there are Christian extremist groups because they think, oh, Christians don't really have reason to be extremists. You know, nothing's going on with them. Um, most people think that there are only Islamic uh, extremist groups and that extremist groups only live in, you know, Africa or, continent or Europe, you know, continents like that. But that's definitely not true. The, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center released a list, and it has an, this names and names and names of United States religious extremist groups that we never hear about. The Army of God and the Westboro Baptist Church being the most popular. That's why I'm using those two as my examples, because people have probably heard about them, or really, you know, skimmed over an article about them, but don't really know about them. Now, the more dangerous and the more prevalent groups, I would say, would definitely be groups like ISIS and Boko Haram. These are Islamic uh, terrorist groups, extremist groups, and they do things like, you know, bomb people, behead people, kill people, but they claim that they're doing this as a faith-based thing. And when you really delve deep into religious extremism, you come to a point where you're sitting and you're reading about this and you think, now, in your head, and you and I, we see this and we think, oh, it's bad. You know, these people deserve to be, you know, in prison or whatever. But you also have to think about it in their shoes. They're doing this because someone was behind them saying, oh, you need to do this for our faith, for your religion. And most heavily religious people would go to great lengths to spread their religion. You know, that's a type of diffusion. But you come to the point where you're like, all right, is it, are these people, is it justified that they're doing it because of their religion or is it still terror? And that's a big question, you know, who are we to judge? The God or the gods in the religion that they're doing this religious extremist actions for is the person to judge. And that's, that's what makes this topic so interesting because there's no definite this is good or this is bad because no one can really tell because what they're doing is justified Mm -hmm. And they, in you know, in you and I's opinion, they shouldn't be doing it, but it is still justified. That is, it, it depends on who you are in terms of how you will evaluate what they are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something like beauty is in the eye, eye of, of the, the beholder. beholder. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. It just depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I discussing this, we're like, okay, they are just bad. We just need to, we need to just get rid of them. But when you think about it from their point of view, they're doing this because of their faith, and. You can't really sit up and tell someone to stop doing something because of their faith, because faith is, and religion, is probably one of the strongest factors that brings people together. For instance, you know, church, mass, mosques, pilgrimages, all these things bring people together. It's a lifestyle. And you can't tell someone to break away from what they've known. And people in religious extremist groups, it's not really just strangers coming together. You know, this will be brothers, sisters, um, mothers and fathers, uncles, aunts. These are people who grew up with these views. And that's another thing you have to consider when you're talking about, say, the Westboro Baptist Church. These people didn't just wake up one day and decide to just be hateful. They had this preached to them. Their mothers and fathers probably believed in what they're preaching, and that's the way they grew up. So the things that they do are justified in there. I personally do not believe they're good, but everything has a reasoning. Very good. And so what we'll do, Lana, 
We'll take this second commercial break, and then we'll come back for our final segment, which will give you about 10 minutes to sort of round this out. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. We'll deal with that for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. around and we'll so start. I can see where it takes. I, I can talk about extremist events in yeah, history. Okay. And you <laughs> just talk about the one that started you off, 911, uh, uh. because that was the first <laughs> 9 show. 911, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say 911. That, that was the first show that you did with us, uh, uh, yeah. the Attack on America, you mm -hmm. see. And then if you want to, and then, you know, talk about it from that perspective, you know, sort of reflect on or some of the things that we've done or that you know right, or whatever. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. ready. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Alana McLaughlin and she's giving us some information relative to religious extremism. And of course, Alana, let's uh, take this final segment to be more specific, dealing with uh, some of the uh, more extreme religious groups that uh, our audience might be aware of this morning. As a matter of fact, I think you already mentioned Boko Haram and uh, ISIS. And so if we could uh, simply devote much of this last segment to uh, say as much as we possibly can about these two religious extreme groups and uh, to make uh, people who might be in your age group well aware of uh, the significance of them, of these groups, and why they are important. Well, when people hear the term religious extremism, they're usually taken aback a bit. They're not familiar with it because we don't really use the term that much. We, basically, we use terms like terrorism and terrorist groups, terrorist attacks. And most people, if you say, name a religious extremism event that really shook uh, the population, most would be puzzled. But there are lots that we're definitely aware of that we don't really, well, that we do talk about, but we just don't use the term religious, religious extremism. extremism. when we talk about them. Mm -hmm. An example would be 9 11, the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center, the mm -hmm. Twin Towers. The people who drove those planes into those towers were religious extremists. They were also very mentally ill, and they were suicide pilots, but nevertheless, that was a religious extremist event. And it was in retaliation to the United States going to their Holy Land and setting up bases for, say, war and things and such and disgracing their Holy Land. So people from the Holy Land, which would be, you know, Saudi Arabia, Islamic countries, came over and decided that we're not going to let this happen. We're going to rock them. We're going to scare them. We're going to try to silence them. And that's what prompted 9-11. Another example of religious extremist events would be the church shootings that have been going on. Say uh, there was one here in Nashville and the one in Texas. But things like this are you have to really think about them. You have to get all your facts straight because they could be interpreted two ways. It could either be religious extremism or mental illness. Now, personally, I believe that the one in Nashville was mental illness because I don't think that the man was just some um, religious extremist Christian who wanted to just kill other Christians. I believe that this was truly a mentally ill person who wanted to hurt other people. But 9-11 is definitely religious extremism because it was prompted by a religious extremist group who came from a country that had been scorned by the United States and they wanted to retaliate. Other examples of religious extremism events would be the Parisian uh, bombings, the attacks over there. That is another one that was by a religious extremist group that was in retaliation for something that rubbed them wrong, that involved their religion. And like I said in the last segment, when you think about these things, you have to think about them long and hard because you cannot, you can sit up and tell them that they're wrong and they are wrong for killing people, but at the same time, you have to understand why people do the things that they do and that these are probably people who would be normal under any other circumstance, but they grew up um, 
being pushed into terrorist groups. Because like I said, a lot of times these groups are mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters, family members, or people who grew up together. People don't just wake up and want to be a terrorist. They grew up around these things. So they are doing what they, doing the only thing that they know. That they think that their religion requires them to requires do. Requires them order. to do, to reach whatever holy land or whatever holy awarding they want. This is the reason that they do those things. And we look at it, and we're so quick to judge them, but we have to think, what would you do if you grew up in a household, if you were, if, you're Christian. Say you grew up in a Christian extremist household that said that, oh, you have to kill atheists to go to heaven, or God won't be happy until you uh, bomb abortion clinics like the army of God, or until you pick it um, soldiers' funerals because God hates war, like the Westboro Baptist Church says. What if you grew up like that and went and did all those things? You don't see anything wrong with it. Because that's your what? You're growing up. That's your, that's, that's the part your culture, basically. Mm -hmm. That's what makes you who you are. And outsiders are so quick to judge this, but we need to learn more about these people. And we need to teach more acceptance of people and we need to teach about other cultures and how not every culture, not every person is bad. Because a lot of times these religious extremist groups are, they're born when someone is rubbed wrong by a different religion and this enrages them and they preach hateful words about said religion and it gets so violent that it turns into an extremist group. The Westboro Baptist Church, for instance, one of them was probably scorned by a soldier, and they went on to say, oh, God hates war, and God hates soldiers. Or they were probably scorned by a gay person and believed that all gay people are just, just bad. Now, like I was saying in the last segment, I talked about religious, religious fundamentalism. And fundamentalism is when you interpret the Bible so literally that it becomes an issue. It becomes a bit scary. Like I said, the snake handlers of Appalachia, they handle snakes because they read in the Bible that we should take up serpents. The Westboro Baptist Church hating uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community, which is lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender, and queer, and et cetera. They take from the Bible, which is the holy word of Christianity, they take from this that um, homosexuality is a sin and from that, anything related to homosexuality, which they believe is being bisexual or transgender or just queer in general, they take all of this as sin. And because of that, they take this and what, what brings them from fundamentalist, which is just believing that it's a sin, to extremist, which is really acting against them, is their acts of terror. The Westboro Baptist Church, had they not gone out and picketed or bombed or threatened all these people, their beliefs would just make them a religious fundamentalist, fundamentalist. group. Mm -hmm. But them going into action with these things and going above and beyond to hurt other people makes them a terrorist group, an extremist group. And what's, what's so crazy about them is that they're here in the United States and we hear the least coverage of them out of Boko Haram and ISIS and the Army of God. We don't hear about the Westboro Baptist Church as much as we do other terrorist groups but they're right here in our own country. And so I believe that we should, we should teach more awareness of these groups, and we should also teach acceptance and kindness and love because these people grew up without those things, and they grew up with hateful people in hateful households, and they grew up to be hateful people who wanted to spread their hateful word. And so, Alana, uh, it seems to me that you have been uh, so concerned in terms of uh, these various groups. What do you think in terms of uh, how we might be able to make other people understand uh, what these groups are, not only the way we're explaining today, but to uh, make others have more tolerance, perhaps, at these extreme groups and to be able to understand them? You can never really teach people unless they would like to be taught. I believe that when you're trying to teach people, teach people who want to be taught about these groups and let them know why they do what they do, where they do what they do, and why it isn't bad. Tell them that, you know, Boko Haram is predominantly in Chad, in the continent of Africa, in places like the Army of God and the Westboro Baptist Church are primarily in the United States. Let them know what their beliefs are, why they believe this, and teach them, and teach the people who want to be taught that 
This is not okay. Religious extremism is not okay. Using faith as an excuse to be hateful is not okay. Because religion should bring people together, not tear people down or tell pe tear people apart. That's almost the opposite of all the views of most big religions. You know, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam. It's to bring people together, to love and to worship either your god or your many gods, depending on if you're monotheistic or poly polytheistic. The objective is to bring people together, and people just fail to realize that. Okay, so Alana, let me uh, thank you for this uh, excellent overview of religious fundamentalism this morning, and I'm sure that our audience was able to uh, pull out of it the information that they wanted to uh, pull out of it. And let me encourage our audience to uh, tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you, and good morning.
<laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, sir. How you doing, my brother? Good to see you, man. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you. Mic check for me, please. Oh, okay, I'm up, am I on? Today? Am I on? Yeah, you can um, count to 10 if you like. Oh, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Can you hear me? Okay. So Hello, how are you? I'm doing yes, great. How are you? Right. Doing well. I'm going to try to move this around. Don't start nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he always dressed right, really like good. This you is know? your pocket uh, on this side uh -huh. here. On this side? Mm -hmm. It's cool. There you go. And I hope you don't hear me. call this the injustice of the criminal justice system, Pastor Walker? Uh, uh, what did you well, no, we're going to use that next month when I uh, get Gene Alexander on, okay. but we want to talk about his his organization, Okay. okay. Uh, Unheard Voices. Uh, Unheard Great. Voices. Thank you. Yeah, what, yeah. Unheard, which is an organization that deals with what? Unheard Voices is an outreach, is an organization that uh, is formed to empower former incarcerated persons. So the empowerment of uh, incarcerated, formerly incarcerated society. So let, let's call it that, you know. Okay. That's what that'd be fine to indicate. Uh, yeah. Because when you when you told me that. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. And so we be talking about felonism as well. Huh? Felonism. Felonism. Yes, sir. So what is that? So that was the only one used that term. Oh yeah. One, two, three. Thank you. So it's the legal. <laughs> <laughs> are you gonna be in here are you gonna be in here yeah, if you want no I'm gonna, yeah record it you ready for me okay F-E-L-O. You know, felonism. So it's a legal discrimination against those who have been formerly incarcerated. Is that the, was that the, I was not familiar with that. Right. Term. So we, we, we so we re, so we're redefining uh, what it means to have been inside the criminal justice system. I'm sorry. And so we identify <laughs> felonism for what it means. Hard here, then. <laughs> so there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot. We're trying to we okay. trying to create the, the language so that we can yeah, give guys, ideas. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Needs to do a mic check really quick. See if I still know the alphabet. A B C D E F G H I J K and the mother letters too. That's fine. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, so this is Raheem. Here it is. Yes, right. sir. Yes, Raheem. Sir. Pastor K. Walk. There you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, and the topic is Alana. You put um, so I, I call it, I say understanding the red felonism, but if you want to call it um, yeah, it's, something criminal justice, it's just let's, let's, the, let's, uh, understanding felonism. Uh, he'll, uh -huh. he'll, he'll, he'll explain what it is, he'll define it. Cause yeah, it's a, yeah. Uh -huh. we'll define I that term. I, I picked up on it from Michelle Alexander when she spoke okay. out here at National let, Baptist. Let, 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 uh, America. Yeah. Okay. Let's call it uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, okay. And incarceration. Should have put it on airplane mode. Okay. How, how would that be? I mean, because we're talking about folks, we're talking about the system, right? Yeah, so it could be mass incarceration uh -huh. and what happens uh -huh. after you enter and leave. Okay. Because at the, at the end of the day, we're talking about how this CAD system has been set up for those who are returning but cannot really live a full and wholesome life because all of these barriers are in place from not being able to get yeah. jobs, yeah. not being so able to get own housing. my simple mind. <laughs> Let's call it the criminal justice system and uh, uh, incarceration in Tennessee. That'd be fine. Can y'all go with that? We can go with that, that. Yeah, and then that we'll. Work, huh? Yeah, it can go with that because it's going to segue into yeah, after we. Yeah, criminal justice system and incarceration. Yeah. How would that be? That, that yeah. works for me. Uh, the criminal justice system and incarceration in Tennessee. Okay. All right. All right. We can do that. Frank, fed, uh, we can get that in. Felonism. Oh yeah. Okay, so it's felonism. 
felon. F E L is like, like a person is a felon. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, Got that right. ism on the end there. Yes, sir. And That's it. Racism, sexism, nepotism. Yeah. 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 Yeah, when I was talking about a fellow, F-E-L-L-O-W. Oh, okay, that no. might have been my southern accent. No, no, it was my conception, my hearing. Of right. It. Uh, yeah, this is get fall in line with what I've talked about throughout the years on uh -huh. your program, about the, the prison system and getting out and stuff like that. Uh -huh. That's where I met him at. Okay. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, so what we'll do, we'll simply call it uh, the criminal justice system in Tennessee. Yeah, that'll work. And, that, that, and, and that's generic, and that can fit anything that we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to introduce you as Raheem Buford. Yes, sir. And you as Pastor K. Walker. Yes, sir. Okay. And so what I'll do, uh, we'll start with, we'll start off with Mr. Raheem Buford and have him to give us some information about his background, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I would ex uh, anticipate you taking about three minutes. Okay. I'll be brief Mr. as Buford. possible. Now, you don't have to be brief. Okay. we got six minutes. Okay. What I'm trying to do is to use the six minutes by giving you about three or four mm -hmm. of them and then have you do two minutes of that, mm -hmm. you know, tell who you are. Yeah. You see, and then we come back with that second segment, then we start with you, mm -hmm. uh, with that, for eight, you know, yeah. eight minute segment. Oh, yeah. And then, but we want to start off, off with uh, uh, the unknown here. Give Mr. Buford an opportunity to I really uh, talk about who he is, and uh -huh. especially about mm -hmm. your book. Right. Uh, let's see if we can get that book uh, placed somewhere. Uh, somewhere. Okay. Mr. Buford, so that. Oh, right, that it works. That, that <laughs> let's learn. Can I, could we, could we uh, get a yeah, shot of this? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Still, there were like a yeah see if uh -huh. uh. Okay. Yeah, could you say okay. get a shot of that? Mm-hmm. And so what I, and, and it makes it easy for me to talk about the criminal justice system in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, and then, uh, Introduce you, Mr. Raheem Buford. Yes, sir. You know, as a guest. Thank you. And I have you get <coughs> information about your situation, mm -hmm. background, education, and experience, uh -huh. and then that's mm -hmm. when you bring all your information in, okay. including your book. Okay, I do that. Okay, and then you take about two, or th about three minutes of that six, six, six minutes, mm -hmm. and then we'll come to Pastor Walker. All right. See, and we already, they already know him. All right. But he can give as much information and then okay. bring in what he would like in, 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 in your introduction, bring in what you said okay. that you wanted this to be about. All right. Okay. That'll work. And, that, yeah. and, that would, and, and I can still be saved. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, we, saying, yes, sir. Criminal justice system uh -huh. in Tennessee. Okay. Yeah, I think And so is this, do we look this way? No, or you just look at me. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Just look at All right, great. And don't, don't, don't swing that chair. You know, try to keep that just chair. Just stay, stay yeah, where it is. Yeah, just okay. stay this will work. simple. Enough. Okay. And so, Mr. Uh, Buford, we're going to start with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll introduce the show. Uh -huh. The topic this morning is the criminal justice mm -hmm. system in Tennessee. That mm -hmm. captures all of whatever the two of you have to talk about, okay? Mm -hmm. And then our guest is Mr. Raheem uh -huh. Buford. Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is the uh, yeah I was yeah I was wondering where we going to sign.
thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is the criminal justice system in Tennessee. And we're fortunate to have with us to talk about the criminal justice system in Tennessee, Mr. Raheem Buford and Pastor Kay Walker. And so Mr. Buford, let's see if we can start this show off this morning by uh, giving you an opportunity to give us some information about your background, your education, and some of your experiences, as well as to say something about the book yes, that you brought with you. And then Pastor Walker will uh, help round this first segment off by giving us some information in reference to uh, his experiences and et cetera. And then we'll be able to uh, move into that second segment. Let's uh, start off with you by uh, talking about your background, education, and some of your experiences, Mr. Buford. Thank you, Dr. Haney. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I was born out South Nashville, moved to East Nashville. Early on in my life, I um, had a lot of issues at home, dysfunctional family, found myself um, doing some bad things in life. Ended up in the juvenile detention center uh, at 16. I was there for about six months and less than nine months, I um, was charged with felony murder. And I ended up uh, pleading guilty to a life and 20 year sentence and I was caged for 26 years of my life at seven different prisons throughout the state of Tennessee. I was released uh, June the 25th, 2015. Since then, um, I'm, I enrolled in American Baptist College. I am presently, uh, currently a junior. I work with the Children's Defense Fund Nashville team. And uh, our mission is to disrupt and dismantle the cradle to prison pipeline. I founded the Unheard Voices Outreach. Our organization is specifically designed to empower formerly incarcerated persons. Mm -hmm. And I penned a book titled Save Your Own Life. Choosing the Right Path is Not Always Clear mm -hmm. for Troubled Youth. Mm -hmm. I uh, go into the juvenile detention centers every Thursday and I facilitate critical reading, writing, and dialogue sessions with young youth under the P3 project, which is plugging the pipeline to prison. Mm -hmm. Very good, Pastor Walker. Uh, yes, I'm Pastor Kelvin Walker, born here in Nashville, Tennessee. Been on your show numerous times and glad to be back here again this morning on your show as well. Uh, I'm a military Navy veteran. Uh, also, I'm an ex-offender, served time in the Tennessee State Prison System for various crimes. As a result, result of my 17-plus you know, years of drug addiction, which, of course, didn't end when I was incarcerated because there's just enough drugs in there. As it is on the outside, just a little bit more difficult to get. But uh, back in 1986, on August 24th, to be exact, God uh, broke that drug addiction in my life, called me directly into ministry. And ever since then, I've been... Uh, uh, doing ministry, works of ministry in the church, and also advocating more so outside of the pulpit uh, on behalf of people incarcerated in the, in the prison system, people who are homeless, people who are drug addicted. And that's where I met Mr. Uh, Raheem Buford uh, out there at River Bend uh, Maximum Security Prison uh, through an organization called uh, New Beginnings. And uh, we uh, formed a relationship out there at the prison. And it's so, uh, I'm so grateful to see him uh, on this side. Because, you know, mm -hmm. I've always talked about Dr. Haney throughout the years of coming mm -hmm. on your program mm -hmm. about that signal that's beamed uh, from the courtroom through the judicial process uh, all the way to the gates of the prison system. Then when we get there, we drop them off and fail to realize that there is a positive side of incarceration. So we're here with Mr. Buford to uh, actually highlight and show that positive side of incarceration. A very uh, articulate gentleman, very smart, very knowledgeable of what's going on. And uh, he's got out, formed an organization called Unheard Voices. And that's what we want to talk about, you know, because we're talking about helping and empowering ex-offenders once they get out because there's such a shortage of programs and opportunities for us as ex-offenders when we're out. You know, when you think about it, man, my conviction, my last conviction was back in the mid-80s, early 80s, 83 was to be exact. And uh, I can go apply for a job right now today and my record can prohibit me from getting that job. And you know, that's, that's sad. You know, when do we stop serving these life sentences? You know, you get 1129, you know, I didn't have, I had one, but it, it was just part of my sentences. But uh, you can get 1129 today and uh, be branded as a life offender because for the rest of your life, that felony conviction will uh, follow you. And it's organizations like his that's designed to help empower people to help them overcome many of the obstacles mm -hmm. out there. And, anxious to hear him talk more and more about it during your show today. As a matter of fact, Mr. Buford, let's, uh, over the last next, uh, well, it's almost, this segment is, has almost ended. But when we come back, what we want you to do is to uh, start us off uh, by giving us some information in reference to uh, your book, because I think we 
we showcased it once here, but give us some information about the book and some of the things in reference to your organization so that we might use you as an example this morning of what can be done, because I think that many people are aware of uh, some of the problems that we have with our young people, and I think that you've already indicated that you were one of those problem children at one time, and so something that you might be able to say when we come back to, for the second segment that will turn some of these uh, young men and young women around, and so that's what we'll do. And so we're gonna take our first, first commercial break, and we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. <laughs> if it weren't from you, man, I don't think I probably would even have an unheard voices outreach. You know, just coming in there and breathing life into us. And say that, us. make make yeah. notice of that too, because yeah. I think that I'm aware of when he said the New Beginnings program. Uh -huh. I know about that program, mm -hmm. and so yeah. that's when he got in touch with you dealing with that yes, program, sir, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. and so he he has had a tremendous impact yes, upon sir. your life. Yes, uh, in, in, in term, and, and and say something about uh -huh. that. You know, I, you know, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, give him a little press this morning you see? <laughs> <laughs> and let him uh, need it. take a uh -huh. about four minutes. You uh -huh. take about four or five minutes okay. and then let him take the four mm -hmm. minutes and sort of say something yeah. and then we'll have that mm -hmm. ten minute segment and we'll yeah. wrap it up. But I think this is exactly what we want to see. Because yeah. every morning you turn on the television. This morning there was three young men mm -hmm. right. robbed somebody, took somebody's car. Yeah. You yeah. know, and <clears throat> a car uh -huh. in it. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Mr. Buford and Pastor Walker in reference to the criminal justice system in Tennessee. Uh, Mr. Buford, let's see if we can start off uh, this segment by having you to say something about your book and then something about the organization in which uh, you are a part of. And then I think you'll have an opportunity to make some statements in reference to those young men that we were talking about. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Henry. But first, before I speak on the book, I just want to speak about it's, it's important to pay homage to those who go into the prisons, like uh, my brother here, Pastor Walker, because had it not been for him, I don't think I have an unheard voices outreach because it was through him that our voices came out into this world. And I don't think we give enough credit to individuals who go in and out of the prisons. Those are some of the unsung heroes, and I just think that we need to recognize them more. But as it relates to my book, um, Save Your Own Life, Choosing the Right Path, is not always clear, it's on Amazon. I penned this book specifically uh, for at-rich youth because what I've learned is the cradle prison pipeline begins uh, in school with the literary score, liter literacy scores. And they know by third grade, if you can't read, there's a likelihood that you're gonna end up in prison. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, as I was writing the book in prison, it's a compilation of short poems and short prose, and it's interactive. And it's more about asking the question, who am I? Because these young uh, kids who are out in this world messing up do not have a clue as to their identities because they are following uh, the wrong people. It, whether it be gangs, whether it be older people in their lives, they're um, acting out in ways that they really don't understand and their behavior is saying something that they do not have the intellect or the uh, vocabulary mm -hmm. to express intelligently. So as it relates to my organization, Unheard Voices Outreach, half of the board is are formerly incarcerated persons who have excelled without going through programs. One of our members uh, is an attorney here in Nashville. One of our uh, members is an entrepreneur. Uh, one of our members is just an ordinary, uh, everyday uh, working person. One of our uh, uh, members is an advocate, a national advocate who goes around the country to help uh, remove juvenile life sentences. And the other half of our board are um, individuals who go into prisons or help people trans out of, transition out of prisons. What's unique about it is that we take responsibility for our own in the sense that those of us who are formerly incarcerated, because we want to move away from that ex-offender language because that's system language. Mm -hmm. It dehumanizes. Mm -hmm. 
So we will either say uh, formerly incarcerated or returning citizen. If we're talking about persons on the inside, we're talking about insiders or prisoners. Because one of the things that we have decided to do is reclaim the narrative. Because we were human beings before we were labeled as convicts. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And so if we allow <clears throat> that language to be how we identify ourselves, it's no wonder that 75% of individuals who go into the uh, prison system throughout the United States of America will return in, in, in five years. And so we are doing what is called customized release plans. Mm -hmm. So we want to sit with individuals and find out what their goals, their dreams, their aspirations are. And how can we facilitate? Where can we find stakeholders? How can we partner with the churches, the congregations of faith? Who wants to be a stakeholder so that we can make contributions and be the leaders in transition? We want to move away from the nonprofit industrial complex where our images and our lives, our stories are being used to uh, uh, bring in large sums of, of monies. But when we are asked, uh, when we ask if we can work in those particular mm -hmm. uh, nonprofits, we cannot. And so why not empower ourselves to demonstrate that we can do this work ourselves if we just get the support of the community. We don't want to blame, we don't want to point fingers. We want to say that some of us were transformed. Others have not been transformed. But if you give us an opportunity to go back into the prisons like Pastor Walker, create some programs that we know will work because we know what happened for us, mm -hmm. I guarantee you that this system can be changed overnight, but they have to give us an opportunity. And as it relates to the young men who are constantly out there committing these violent acts, we have to deal with the, the root of the problem. A lot of this violence starts in the home. We live in a nation of violence. We can't ignore that fact that it's even in the national anthem, but it doesn't excuse the behavior. So what people like myself have to do and others, we have to go in and get in proximity with these young men and listen to what they're going through. And when you find out some of the abuses that these young men have suffered, mm -hmm. you'll probably understand why. It doesn't excuse it, but mm -hmm. our approach to justice cannot be retributive justice. It has to be restorative justice or transformative justice. And this asks the question, who was harmed? How do we approach healing? And this begins with those who have survived crimes. We move away from victimization and get into those who survived. We move away from offender and we uh, used language like who, those who caused injuries. And when we start changing the language, other things change as well. Very good. What do you think about that, Pastor? Uh, you know, that's, that's something. One thing I picked up on is taking away the, and removing those labels, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I, you know, I said, as I said here, and I, I introduced myself, and I mm -hmm. said I was an ex offender. Mm -hmm. and, and to be one to, I put that label right there on myself that uh, they're removing, uh -huh. you know, and, and, you know, it just enlightened me right there. Yeah, I committed crime, Crump, but uh -huh. I, I am a formerly incarcerated individual. Uh -huh. And from hence, this far, point forward, I'll stop using that label because uh -huh. I'm trying to remove those labels. And, and, and that was effective right then uh -huh. and now at uh -huh. this particular moment. It, took it, it had uh -huh. an effect, so I can imagine the effect that it's having throughout across the board, you know, and taking those labels away and redefining it, uh -huh. you know, taking, taking it back, you know, uh -huh. and taking it away from them that, that says we are this and we are that, and, and just dispelling that. And it's been saying one identifying yourself and yeah. saying who you are, absolutely, regardless of what your situation and, might have been. Now right. you are what? In other words, don't identify me by my past. Mm -hmm. You know, I did what they said I did. I, I did all those things, but I'm not who they say I am. I'm, I, I am Kelvin L. Walker. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. It's my mother who she named me, and, and that's what she named me. And, and I have character uh, traits and things like that that, that are of a uh, higher standard than they were when I was out there in the streets doing what I was doing. And another thing he said about, talked about the, uh, the way they look at the third graders and, and their reading and to determine who's going to be incarcerated. You know, they take those figures. Right now, I'm, I presently got a uh, third grade grandson in, in Indiana that each, each and every day over the phone, he reads to me for 20 minutes every day because mm -hmm. they've done a study that children that read for 20 minutes every day, they will become proficient in reading. Mm -hmm. And they got these tests that they have to pass, you know, in order for them to move on to the next grade. Mm -hmm. So we're making a determined effort to make sure mm -hmm. that he's a proficient reader because as a child, one of the things that I was, I was a proficient reader. I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I love to read and I thank God now for my second grade teacher, Mrs. Hale that encouraged my family to get me all these books and stuff because she noticed that his, this child likes to read. And as a result of that, man, I, I've got a library at home and I read, you know, I read studiously and, and, and consistently. I don't just read to, 
to say I read a book, I read to get the knowledge from the book. Mm -hmm. so Very good. So what we'll do, Pastor, we'll take this first, second commercial break, and then we'll come back and give the two of you an opportunity to round us out for the morning. We'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. Okay, so we'll start off again with you, and we've got 10 minutes, and so you take about three or four minutes of that, and then you take about three or four minutes, and I'm going to throw it back over yes, to you sir. and let you round us out. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Finish us out for the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is excellent information. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we every morning we turn on the television, this, you know, just so senseless, yeah. you know. Uh, Going to Planet Hollywood, no, is it Planet, Planet Fitness? Yeah, Planet yeah. Fitness and knocking out the windows <coughs> on yeah. cars and young people. Yeah. Young people. Yeah. Mm. And then and, and they never get away with it, you know. <laughs> it would be different. Oh, man. Yeah. We have a juvenile task force that uh, is trying to find. Um, All right, stand by. We could use this as a solution. Mm. Talk about that. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Mr. Buford and Pastor Walker in reference to uh, the criminal justice system in Tennessee. Uh, let's see, uh, Mr. Buford, if we can uh, start with you during this last segment of the show to give you an opportunity to talk about what you might consider to be some of the solutions. Uh, we've talked about some of the problems, but what are some of the solutions that we might find? Well, on the front end, we have to start investing more in education because as it stands, uh, we only invest like maybe $10,000 per student, but um, we spend roughly $30,000 a year to incarcerate one individual. Mm -hmm. um, as it relates to being in the system, one way we can, we can help is to create transformative programs that engage individuals who are caged in a way that they have to use their minds to do some critical thinking. Because as it stands, these rehabilitation programs are memory oriented or behavior oriented. You can act it out, but that never um, uh, transforms you from the inside out. We also have to uh, become stakeholders in outcomes at parole hearings. As it stands, the state of Tennessee has about 18,000 parole hearings uh, a year, and less than 5,000 people are released from prison. You have individuals sitting on parole boards making $5,000 uh, a month that do not even live in our communities. And so when people go up for parole, they should be um, evaluated for their suitability for, for release. But what we have is they are retried. Retry. And so my uh, hope is that the faith communities will begin to come into these uh, parole hearings and support individuals coming back, engage in relationship building so that when these individuals come back into the community, Unlike the prodigal son who was rejected by his brother, we can have the father who will fatten the calf, meaning somebody comes out, what do you need? How can we help you provide for yourself? What are your goals, your aspirations? Not a handout, but a hand up. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing um, we can do is that help us move toward entrepreneurship when we get out of prison. Because what I found to be true for myself, I have a carbonitizer instructor's license. I've been cutting hair since I was 12 years old. I do it on the side now because this work that I'm doing now, I feel is much more important that I talk about the realities that human beings are facing within this uh, criminal injustice mm -hmm. system. And last, as, as I wanna say about this, I wanna thank everyone who goes into a prison because when you can go into a, a prison and sit with someone who has been condemned, you humanize that person. And when you humanize that person, the light comes on. And when that light comes on, the 95% of individuals who are going to be released, you stand a better chance at a better person coming out of prison. Pastor? You know, <clears throat> a, lot, a lot's being said, and, and you know, I, I admire what uh, Raheem is doing in, in, with his organization, Unheard Voices because it's a definite need. There's a need out there for those of us who are formerly <laughs> incarcerated yes, 
to, uh, to get involved. And, and what I do find too also is that many of, of, of us who are formerly, have been formerly incarcerated are, are not willing to get back in, get involved in helping those who are yet still incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Although we've been released and stuff like that. And I understand some of the stigma that goes along with that. You know, there's, that, I think there's a measure of fear from the system itself, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that would maybe perhaps come after them in, in some kind of way, especially when you're know, uh, on parole and stuff like that. But at the same time, you know, there's a higher standard, there's a higher calling that's involved when we must esteem others greater than ourselves and get into the trenches and help others. So I, I've never had a fear of what the system may, may do to me as a result of that. And of course, I've had my program, the Hands of God Recovery Ministries that I ran in the past, helping many people that was incarcerated in the system get out and, you know, get them on a the pathway to, to live in, in a just and society. I had my program blacklisted by the, uh, the then, uh, uh, not the parole board, but the, uh, the supervision aspect part of that uh, mm -hmm. deal, I can't put, my, put the name on it right now because it's, it's been transferred into TO, TDOC now, mm -hmm. but it was the Department of Probations and Parole. They blacklisted me and took my uh, program off the list. Mm -hmm. So I was therefore unable to bring people out of the system into my program. Mm -hmm. One of the things I was doing, I was not charging people. Uh, if they didn't have the money to come out, I wouldn't, I wouldn't charge them. There was mm -hmm. many other organizations, things that were charging them when they did come out, and I wouldn't do that. You know, and it didn't matter to me if there was a sex offender or whatever, I would take anybody into my pro. I didn't care what crime they committed or anything. Mm -hmm. Because I, I believe that a person can be transformed. If you if you go inside of a if you get inside of a person's heart and the mindset and, and try to help them develop and, and identify who they really are as opposed to how they have how they have been, been labeled, labeled to uh -huh. be, then you can bring that pro person through a transformational mm -hmm. process and, and they begin to become productive and constructive citizens mm -hmm. of our society. But uh, to look at this you have to look at the whole picture. And I think that many of us who are formerly incarcerated do have, also have a desire to get in and to help, but we have been stymied a lot of time in our efforts to do so. In other words, they won't, they won't allow us the access that we should have because who could better help somebody that's going through something mm -hmm. than yeah. somebody that has that's already good, gone good through it mm -hmm. and has avoided the pitfall, been caught up in the pitfall, overcome it, triumphed over it, and, and, and made our way past that and, and living productive lives now. We're better qualified to help than anybody that may say perhaps have a social psych psychology degree or what have you, but have never experienced what we've experienced, have never been behind that fence, have never been behind that wall in, in the state prison system and have never have to deal with an environment where tension can be so high on any given day that you can almost cut it with a knife. You know, we, we know what it's about. We know how to deal. We know how the people get up and how they interact and how they think and how they, how they you know, how they do what they do. But like I say, I'm not here to talk, man. I, I need mm -hmm. to hear from this brother because mm -hmm. this brother got a wealth of information. I want to get him on here for a while and he's here and mm -hmm. I need to be quiet. And okay, Buford, now you've got about three minutes. What are some of the things you want to wow. leave us with this morning? Wow. Well, the first thing I want to say that every human being has inherent worth. And we have to do away with a system that places more value on black and brown bodies caged in prisons than they do for those who are out here working. You use that word, Mr. Buford, yes, cage. Sir. I yes, think sir. you said you use it three or four. What yes, do you mean? Sir. How do you, when you say what, that, what, what comes out when you say that? I, I use that term because I want to give society an idea of what you really feel like when you are inside of what we call incarcerated, what we call confined. Those are sanitized terms for me because they do not denote the realities of the pain, the misery, the violence, the suffering, the restriction, the deprivation, all of the things that you experience on the inside when the system frames it it, it does an injustice to the reality of the experience mm -hmm. itself. So. Uh, my uh, mentor, Janet, Reverend Janet Wolf, she said, brother, you know you were caged. Don't be ashamed to admit that. Mm -hmm. and, and I've been talking about it ever since. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And so I, I guess what I want to say is we have to put people in places in the system who care about human beings. Mm -hmm. Because if you care about what you're doing, the way that you treat me will have a direct effect on how I treat others. Mm -hmm. And so we got to get away from people working in this system because they want to get revenge. Mm -hmm. Revenge is up to God. You find that to us. be uh, quite common in, in, in the system? That Unfortunately so. I find it quite common. Uh, for example, I was taking uh, Vanderbilt Divinity School uh, courses while I was uh, at River Bend Maximum Security Prison. And later I would take some uh, American Baptist College courses. 
and then Lipscomb. Individuals who worked there felt like we should not be educated. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand it because one post-secondary education class reduces recidivism by 20%. If you complete a college education, you have like almost 0% recidivism. Mm -hmm. And so it's important in terms of the terms that you use and the attitude that they take in reference to of what you're doing. Is that what we're saying? Yes, sir. And, and so, Pastor, I think, I think we're getting ready for the uh, final part of this uh, show for today. But I want to thank you for introducing us yes, to uh, uh, Mr. Buford because I think that he has uh, a point of view, mm -hmm. a lot of information that uh, we should try to get on this show. As a matter of fact, I think Mr. Buford uh, complimented yes. us by saying that he has had an opportunity to see us in yes. the system. Yes. And, I like, uh, and I appreciate that to know yes. that somehow, uh, 25 seconds yes. past. I would just like for him to yes. give us uh, how, we, how he can, those that are watching can get mm -hmm. in touch with your organization. Okay. So one of the ways you can, you can contact me is I'm on Facebook as Raheem Buford, um, the Unheard Voices Outreach. You can Google that. My book, Save Your Own Life, is on Amazon. And pretty much my name is just widespread. Okay, and so what we'll do, and, and, and let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning. Mm -hmm.
Go ahead and talk about it. Start off by with him and it's it, the first six minutes. Gotcha. You want to go? Mic check, mic check. One, two, three. And for you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, Demetrius. Is it Demetrius. <laughs> oh, he doesn't have it connected. <laughs> oh, I just, I just looked down. <laughs> oh, this is the right Oh, um, actually, yeah. Hold on. Y'all trying to step out of the IRA. Y'all got me in this chair. I'm scared of this chair. Then you can't rock it and can't move it. That's why I tried my best not to move. I just crossed my little ankles. I'm just there like that. Oh, you your technique then. <laughs> so I get out of work for me. I take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten.
Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is Dads Against Destruction. And we're fortunate to have with us this morning to talk about Dads Against Destruction, uh, Mr. Phil Hawkins and Mr. Demetrius Drawhill. And of course, let me welcome you, Mr. Drawhill and uh, Mr. Hawkins to thank the show you. this morning well, and uh, tell you how delighted not only are we to see you, All but right. we're delighted to have an opportunity to talk about the topic that yes, we're going to deal yes, with sir. this morning, Dads Against Destruction. Yes, As a matter of fact, I think we had a group that came on earlier about Moms yeah. Against Destruction, M-O-M, -M, Moms yeah. Against Murder. Yeah, Mom I think murder. that, yeah. that was Ms. Uh, Greenlee's Greenlee. program, and yeah. I think both of you are familiar mm -hmm. with uh, Ms. Greenlee. Let's start off with you, uh, Mr. Uh, Hawkins. Wow. I think you're familiar with what we do here by having you to uh, give us some information about your background, your education, and some of your experiences, and talk for about two or three minutes, and Mr. Demetrius will, Demetrius will give us some additional information in reference to his situation, okay. and then we'll move out into this uh, second segment. Okay, I'm Phil Hawkins. I started Daddy Gets Instruction three years ago. You know, living as, in the world that we were living in, I wanted my son to have better, you know. Graduated from Glencliff High School, came from the South Nashville area, and just to having to be with Clement Greenlee one day, we got to talk about we need more dads out here to step up and do the man role. So I told her I'd take that challenge, and it's been going good ever since three, three years. All blessings to God. And so you, 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 you found it, have found this uh, program, Dads Against the... What was the motivation behind that uh, program? I got incarcerated, and my son, which was, was with me, was incarcerated with me, and I, we were like six months, we wouldn't around each other. Mm -hmm. So it just took a whole lot of it. It just broke my spirit. Mm -hmm of being, you know, trying to be a friend instead of being a father. Mm -hmm. So I said after that, I prayed to God, everybody opened them doors, he did, and I just changed everything around. Mm -hmm. Demetrius, what about you? What you? What's your situation? Well, my name is Demetrius Dodger, like you said, and uh, I'm the founder, operator of Demetrius Designs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an entrepreneur here in the city. Uh, I'm a major supporter of the Dad's program. I'm a dad myself. Mm -hmm. I have two girls. I have a 15-year-old and 8-year-old. And uh, I truly stand behind what the DASH program stands for. Uh, I grew up in the north side of town, John Henry Hill Homes, a single parent household, the oldest of 10 kids. Uh, found myself going down the wrong path. Uh, went through different obstacles throughout life. Found my way. Eventually got back on the right path. Went ahead and graduated from Pearl Cone. Uh, did a semester in college, but still had one foot in, one foot out of the street life got so consumed up with the street life that I didn't have enough time to go ahead and remain in college. So, uh, and plus I was taking care of the bills and stuff at home, so I had to stand up, like I said, being the oldest of 10 kids, five within my own household. And so, uh, just me just going through different obstacles and stuff in life, found my way, figured it out, became an entrepreneur, and here we are today. You were able to overcome. You think I was some, able to overcome, most definitely. Challenges, and, 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 and so you would also agree with that, uh, yes, Mr. Hawkins, yes, that sir. if you can find your way, mm -hmm. in a real find sense, it. and you think that this organization plays a significant role mm -hmm. oh, yes, in sir. helping to uh, people to find their way. Yes, sir. Whether it's dealing with child support, whether it's whether dealing with over citizen, whether it's dealing with uh, get your driver's license, basic things that these guys out here that ain't got comfortable, the system, they keep blaming the system and they ain't got comfortable. We stand in here, no, nah, you don't have to go, like, it's, it's a better way. And so you, 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 your, your program is aimed primarily at younger men. I, I wouldn't imagine you accept anybody, but you try to reach the young people. And yeah, we go to the young, we go to the older. Mm -hmm. so these days, the older ones, they're older by age, but that mindset is not there. We try to change the mindset. We change the mindset. It they run smooth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, Demetrius, uh, mm -hmm. you became involved with this program. How did you become involved with uh, I became dance? involved with this program when uh, Phil reached out to me. He let me know exactly the concept and everything around his program. And like I said, me being a father, I was very supportive of that. And so, in the midst of me helping brand the Dads Against Destruction, he needed some apparel, he needed some things to get himself on out there, and with that being my expertise, I helped brand him. Mm -hmm. I helped brand him in a manner to where when he go out there, people are not only attracted to what it is that he's talking about, but his presentation is professional. And so when he step on out there, the kids, they gravitate to him because they look at the apparel and stuff that he have on and they really do enjoy it. And so they're re very receptive to what he's yeah. saying in the midst of talking to him because they like how he look. Mm -hmm. And so that's how me and Phil went ahead and, and 
merge forces in between what it is that he's doing and what it is I do. And very good. And so what we'll do, uh, we'll come back. We've got about a half a minute before our first commercial break. Mm -hmm. And when we come back, we'll give both of you an opportunity to talk about some examples in terms of some of the lives that uh, the two of you have changed. Mm -hmm. Because I think I indicated earlier that there's a real need for our young people to hear mm -hmm. some of these things. You turn on the That's television right. every morning and you are almost That's astounded right. mm -hmm. with some of the things that they're doing. And so what we'll do, we'll have this commercial break and we'll come back and we'll talk about some of these things. And we'll be back with you following this very, very short commercial break.